Hi guys, welcome back to the Matt's Movie Reviews channel. I am your host Matthew Perkovich and here with another tier list today. We're going to, I'm going to continue to look at my decades of horror. Today I'm going to look at the 1980s. Now for a lot of people, the 1980s is the decade for horror and horror films. That's when the genre really became uh, like an industry within its own, especially with the, uh, the, uh, the um, advent of um, uh, home movies, home video, I think uh, that was a big factor in it and just the number of franchises that was born during the 1980s and the number of filmmakers that came out such as your John Carpenter's, your Wes Craven's and so many others as well. Um, it's just a survival decade for everything in the 80s and I think there's still a lot of, um, to this day, a lot of remnants from that decade and all the great uh, 1980s filmmaking is still felt today, I, I believe. Um, in, in, a lot, in a lot of things. Um, Sam Raimi is another example of that. He's, a, he's one of the guys who, um, with the Evil Dead series and other movies like um, Dark Man, for example, uh, really brought forth the, um, the uh, horror filmmaking uh, to new plateaus. Uh, John Landis is another filmmaker who delved into horror filmmaking in the 1980s. So many great films and filmmakers from that time. So today is going to be a treat to really dive into uh, the decade and rank um, a lot of these 1980s uh, beloved classics and not so beloved classics um, in uh, on my tier rank uh, tier maker here um, list of 1980s horror movies. Just want to make sure that you guys all um, subscribe to my channel here at Matt's Movie Reviews and I just want to let you know that there's um, links down below um, that have um, a lot of my affiliate um, uh, programs. Uh, one of them being Tee Public. That's a place where I buy a lot of my t-shirts. I love movie themed t-shirts. Big movie fan. Of course, as you know, it's on here. And today's shirt is my Ghostbusters Ray Ray's Occult Books shirt. And also check out <clears throat> my Patreon. That's another way that you could support Matt's movie reviews um, or patrons. Um, paid patrons um, can have uh, can request uh, movie reviews, can request uh, movie reactions, and you also get exclusive posts such as full-length uh, movie react reactions and reviews that are featured on my YouTube channel. First movie we're going to look at is Aliens, uh, 1986, the uh, sequel uh, to the 1979 um, breakthrough movie Alien. James Cameron directs this one. It's more of a um, action you know, action horror sci-fi <clears throat> compared to the more kind of like um, suspense-driven movie that the first movie was. Sigourney Weaver returns in the role of uh, Ripley. So in the first movie, Sigourney Weaver was basically unknown. By the time Aliens rolls around, she's already been in movies like Ghostbusters and The Working Girl. I believe she already had her Oscar nomination, I think, for Gorillas in the Mist. So she's like, you know, one of the biggest stars in Hollywood. And she got Oscar nominated for this role as well, which for a lot of us genre fans know um, is something that's um, really um, rare for a movie like a sci-fi horror movie like an Alien to get any type of consideration. I prefer the first movie, Alien, um, the Ridley Scott movie. There's something about that film in regards to its suspense and the world building. It was just really, you know, pardon the pun, but it was really kind of out of this world. And the second movie is great as well. James Cameron by this time already had the Terminator under his belt. So he really brought that kind of visual style, um, action filmmaking visual style to, to Aliens. And also in regards to the, the tech gear and the, the vehicles and such that this movie has. Considering that, I'm still going to put it up here in the four tier because it is a great film. I'm not as big as fan, like I said, as other people. A lot of people have this like in their top 10 best horror sci-fi movies of all time. I'm not there with this one. Um, it is a great film, and like I said, all the, all the elements in it are fantastic. A movie that I do um, have unabashed love for in many ways is American Werewolf in London, released in 1981, directed by John Landis. In my opinion, one of the best horror comedies of all time, one of the best werewolf movie movies of all time as well. Love what John Landis does with this movie in regards to the horror, column, uh, uh, horror comedy elements. Rick Baker did the uh, makeup effects in this movie. What Rick Baker does here in that transformation scene um, in the movie. It's just phenomenal. And also what John Landis does with a lot of the dream sequences in the movie is fantastic as well. Jenny uh, Agutter, who stars in the movie um, as the nurse who takes care of the main character played by David Norton. Um, I think she was kind of like the um, uh, dream girl for a whole generation 
of um, movie watching fans, especially um, uh, you know genre movie fans, and for good reason. She's fantastic in this movie. Griffin Dune in supporting character as a supporting character is fantastic as well. I love 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 this movie. I love it so much, and a lot of people are going to get a little pissed at me about this. I'm going to put it ahead of Aliens because I'm a huge fan of American and Werewolf in London. Next up, we have Angel Heart. It's kind of like a like a noirish kind of film noir kind of film i guess like what, what you call it like neo-noir right and it's a very much a mystery uh, movie um stars mickey rourke as a private eye who's hired by um this guy named louis cypher played by um robert de niro and in the name louis cypher i guess you can kind of uh in spoilers for out there for anyone who hasn't seen angel heart but louis cypher lucifer um he does play this uh Lucifer, Mephisto, kind of a devil uh, character in the movie. Yeah, it's got one of the best twists, I think. The twist isn't so much about De Niro being um, Lucifer. It's more in regards to why um, <laughs> De Niro is playing Lucifer in the film. Why is that character in the movie? What's going on here? Um, and uh, it's just part of the overall mystery of the movie. It's directed by um, Alan Parker, one of my favourite uh, directors, um, and I, I think um, what Mickey Rourke does in this movie is just fantastic. He plays the role of Harry Angel, the private detective I was talking about before. Um, I, I can't recommend this film uh, enough. It's one of my favourites. And um, where I'm going to put it, I'm going to put it here in the four tier as well. I think I might put it ahead of Aliens. Yeah, ahead of Aliens behind an American werewolf in London. Day. If you haven't seen Angel Heart, I really, really recommend people check it out. Okay, coming up next, we have Beetlejuice. When you, we delve into horror comedies of all, all facets here, and Beetlejuice is a, a prime example of a filmmaker in Tim Burton, which now I think a lot of people think Tim Burton and they, they have in their head straight away what a Tim Burton film is, who he's going to cast in the movie, um, you know, who's going to, you know, Danny Elfman's going to do, you know, the soundtrack, and it's going to be the same type of um, uh, visuals and everything else. Um, so, so today it is seen, seen as old hat. When Beetlejuice came out in, in 1988, it was really kind of like um, groundbreaking um, in Tim Burton's visual style. The movie, like I said, is a horror comedy. It stars Alec Baldwin and Gina Davis as this unmarried uh, couple. Um, they uh, uh, die in a uh, in a car accident, um, and they return as ghosts into their in their um, family home. And when this yuppie family come in, um, played by one, some of them um, played by. Um, Catherine um, O'Hare, who's fantastic in every movie, and a very young Winona Ryder who really um, made her... Um, uh, I, I'm pretty sure Heathers came after this, so I'm pretty sure Beetlejuice was the first movie to kind of introduce her um, to a, like, a larger audience. These, this um, couple, in Alec Baldwin and Gina Davis, just aren't having it, and they bring about a bio-exorcist who's played by Beetlejuice, this really kind of um, macabre, crude... Uh, I don't know if he, if he was human before, or whether he's just like some type of demonic presence or what have you, but he's played by Michael Keaton in what is essentially a supporting role. Um, he doesn't appear in the film as much as like, you know, Alec Baldwin or Gina Davis does. I, feel, I guess you could call him a third lead in a, in a certain context, but he's fantastic in the movie because he's just really kind of crude and in the humour is just fantastic and the, the physicality that he brings to performance is fantastic as well. And of course, that mixed with it, Tim Burton's kind of unique sense of style is that it brings about a really unique kind of horror comedy. Now, how much do I like this film? I do like it quite a bit, but the, the parts in the film that I like the most are the parts that involve Michael Keaton, because his performance is just fantastic in the movie. I think it's his, probably his maybe his best performance um, ever. Um, and that's saying something because I know Michael Keaton has, has given us excellent performances um, over the last, you know, 30 odd years or so, 30, 40 years. When he's off the screen, the film, I find you kind of lag a bit because, you know, you have both Gina Davis and Alec Baldwin, they're both playing the straight roles here. Um, and they're great actors, but they're not, they don't deliver anything too um, um, memorable in their performances. I guess you could have anyone play those two roles whatsoever. The the, the best performances in the film totally belong to um. Michael Keaton, and of course, overall, I think the biggest star of the movie is Tim Burton himself and what he brings to the role. So I'm going to put this here in the three column. It will be a high three. Probably, like, if I was going to give it a score out of five, it'd probably like a three and a half, or three, and three quarters out of five. Next on the list is a film called The Changeling. Now, this is a horror movie that I believe came out in 1980. Uh, okay, yeah, it is 1980, right on. So it's a haunted house movie. 
And George C. Scott plays this widower. He's a music a music professor. He moves into this like this really old kind of like um uh, mansion. He's on his own. Um, and you know weird stuff goes goes on. There's a lot of um bumps in the night. Um, of course, um, with this movie, and um, it's directed by Peter Medak. But what I really loved about the Changeling was just the the atmosphere of the movie, the um the eeriness that um a lot of it had. And um and I thought that um George C. Scott's performance in the film, you know, George C. Scott is one of those guys um who definitely has a um a tendency to go you know o over the top in a lot of his um performances, um. Which you know, it's just like it's his style, right? But um, I think what he does in this movie is a really kind of um sensitive in 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 in, in because of that really kind of effective, um, uh, performance as his um grieving widower who get, gets down to the mystery of this haunting in in his new home. The movie overall as a, a haunted house film is one of the, the better ones that I've seen. Um, it is quite um quite fantastic. I don't think a lot of people have seen the movie. Um, but I really recommend it if you like kind of like supernatural, um, you know, um, uh, haunted house stories um, where it has a really great um, mystery at its core, really fine um, opening performance, great use of atmosphere um, and score as well. I really um, recommend The Changeling. And I'm just going to pop this one around, I think. Let's see. I think I'm going to pop it around just above Beetlejuice, I think. So it's a high three. Next up is Child's Play. I believe this is um, directed by Tom Holland. I think th the biggest star in the movie, uh, above anyone else, is Brad Dariff as the voice of Chucky, who is this possessed doll. So the Chucky doll is kind of like the, the big thing um, in this movie, um, the big um, uh, toy that every kid should have. It's kind of like a um, <clears throat> animatronic kind of toy, kind of talks to you and, and you know, moves its head around and such. Uh, at the start of the film, you have Brad Dowry's character, who's named um, Charles Lee Ray. He um, is um, w fatally wounded in a shootout. He uses some type of, I think it was like a voodoo magic, and he puts his soul into the doll. And the doll is purchased um, by, I'm pretty sure it was purchased or found, I forgot which one it is, by um, the um, lead actress, um, Catherine Hicks. Um, and she gives it to her son named Alex. But Alex, um, you know, sees there's some weird stuff going on with the doll here. And then it, that starts kind of like um, like almost kind of psychological thriller. The mum thinks the kid might be crazy. We know as the audience that he isn't. And Chucky gets all sorts of, all sorts of uh, murderous mischief throughout the movie. It's, it's been done before, I'm sure, where you have like um, um, uh, dolls and puppets and all sorts of things being used in movies. The look of the doll in this movie is really, really... Uh, Something else, so it's almost kind of like a raggedy Ann kind of thing with the red hair and everything. But it's a, it's a, it looks like a, like a younger child, almost kind of like a Dennis the Menace kind of thing to it. But then to see this doll running around and stabbing people and killing people and such, is a, is a bit of a trip. I tell you the truth, when I, when I was watching it, the visual effects in the movie is fantastic, um, especially for its time. Practical effects here. That's the thing about also I love about 1980s horror movies. I said it before in regards to to Rick Baker's work um, and all the, the work also done um, in Beetlejuice as well. Practical effects is, is in there um, is a big thing, you know. And also let's not forget about um, Aliens as well. Such a great practical effects work in there and a set design and everything else. I'm gonna put this in the three. I've, I'll probably give it like a three and a half out of five behind Beetlejuice. Great film, um, you know, but in the context of like all these you know, 1980s horror movies um i'm going to place it right there and i think it's a i think it's a good spot for it there now we're going to move on uh to the dead zone it stars christopher walken in what i think is one of christopher walken's best performances <clears throat> because as i said like i was talking before about george c scott how he has a certain um he has a certain on-screen personality that people you know heavily associate with him um, Christopher Walken, of course, has the same thing. There's sort of like the Walkenisms and in a kind of odd way he kind of speaks and his movements and such and the way he kind of like presents himself on screen, um, which I think especially during the 1990s and, and 2000s was, was maybe very prominent. I think he really dived into that, you know, and he really saw that, that it was working for him. But this movie, The Dead Zone, released in 1983, um, directed by um, David Cronenberg, um, one of my one of my favorite horror filmmakers, and um, this is one of his best films as well. 
Christopher Walken in this movie is fantastic because he he's delivering a really sensitive kind of performance here about as this guy who after a car accident and, and being in a coma is given is develops these powers where he has like visions he, he's, he's a kind of like almost like a, a prophet in a sort of way he has visions of doom that's going to um, come in the future and how he deals with that and how he deals with the fame also that comes with that because he does help out in the movies with crime cases and other things as well and the um, how he looks at it as whether it's a bless blessing or a curse and there's a subplot that deals with that as well um, I think it's like a real um, it's a real rounded performance and I think a lot of it of course has to do number one um, with the writing on Stephen King's novel of course but also how Christopher Walken really brings so much soul uh, to this performance the movie also has Brooke Adams, who was also in um, uh, Invasion of Body Snatchers, one of my favourite movies. Tom Skerritt's in it. Mario Sheen is in it as well as this um, presidential candidate. Um, who in the movie is um, Chris Walken's character, foresees him as being this really kind of like demigod, um, tyrant style um, politician and world leader. And um, he has to take it upon himself to try to, to, try to stop him. So it's got a really great um, uh, story. A great performance by Christopher Walken, great direction by David Credible. And to me, I think, you know, it's going to be sound. I think some people out there, when they watch David Credible movies, they really kind of like, they either really like his really kind of art house kind of stuff, like the stuff he does with um, uh, Naked Lunch, for example, which is which is a film that I never, I could never get into. Um, they like that kind of Cronenberg. Or the other Cronenberg, where he kind of taps into the mainstream mainstream filmmaking. He does things like Dead Zone and Late Run, History of Violence, and and the like. Um, Eastern Promises is another one that he did as well, which I, I think um, those those two movies, the two he did with Viggo Mortensen, I think he did others with Viggo as well. But those two, um, especially, and the Dead Zone, I think are my favourites because um, in one on one hand you have Cronenberg bringing his style, but it's a style that's kind of restricted by the um, by the source material that a lot of these films come with. Um, and I think um, what um, Cronenberg does here is he's like a perfect match to the story uh, that Stephen King wrote. And um, of course, the, like I said before, Christopher Walken is just fantastic in the movie. And I'm going to pop this in the four column, be a low four here, because um, I am a big fan of this movie. Uh, next on the list, we have The Evil Dead. This was released, I'm pretty sure, in 1981. Um, I'm pretty sure it is the debut film from Sam Raimi, unless it did some other obscure film before that. But this was the movie that really put him on the map. And, of course, it introduced Bruce Campbell as the character of Ash, um, the really tortured, uh, put-upon, um, uh, just regular guy from Detroit who... or from Michigan, I should say. I'm pretty sure it's Michigan where the character's from, who um, goes on a um, uh, trip with his friends to a cabin in the woods... Um, and, you know, when they get there, they uncover these um, recordings in this book called the Necrocomicon, and Ash, being the klutz that he is, inadvertently brings forth uh, these demonic creatures um, who one by one possesses his friends, and the only way to defeat them is by dismembering them. So it's an incredibly, incredibly glory piece of work here to Evil Dead. Even for its time, when you watch it now, with all of the practical effects, and it was a very low-budget film as well, um, which makes it a lot of the things that Raimi and his, and his cast and crew, can, how they created a lot of the effects and a lot of the shots in the movie and the um, different filmmaking techniques, and just makes it even more remarkable. What Evil did, this, the first Evil Dead movie, though, is missing um, that, the, that the sequels I had um, is a sense of humour about the whole thing. The madcap zaniness that... Um, let's say the second film which we're going to dive into next um has um really took the evil dead um movie the the, the fran or the potential franchise to a, a another um to another level first movie it's really kind of like when you especially bruce campbell's performance you can really tell that this is a guy who's still trying to find his footing as a um as an actor especially as a, as a leading man in movies and not to say that he didn't do a good job in the in the first Evil Dead, but I'm sure even uh, Bruce Campbell, in all his humbleness, would have um, would say that it's not his best performance. However, it's a performance that's full on committed, um, 
Sam Raimi really puts him through the ringer in this movie as it does other films. There are scenes in the movie that are still controversial to this to this day. Um, the gore in the movie is still quite quite something to watch, even though it was made back in, all the way in 1981, and some of the effects might seem a bit dated. However, like I said, I love the practical elements of a lot of these, a lot of these films. I love the... Um, Especially when films like this, like these independent films that you know, had like a quarter, if a quarter of a quarter of a quarter of a budget compared to like a lot of the um, um, horror movie, um, studio horror movies. And it, it just re was released. It became, a, you know, became this kind of like cult underground hit. It had people like Stephen King, for example, um, praising the film for just how great of, of a movie it is. I'm going to put it high up in the three tier. So I think I might put it around here yeah at the top so it's like a high three. Ooh, there we go so it's a high three there i think um just great innovative independent horror filmmaking there it really is um but it's nothing compared um compared to what evil dead part two um does um with similar material um same lead actor and also um, sam raimi i'm back he's I, I think a lot of the lessons learned from the first movie um is was um administered i guess you could say to the second and they made a phenomenal movie in the second movie, film um i think one of the best horror comedies of all time the the slapstick physical just madcap performance that bruce campbell gives sort of the physicality that he delivers in it it's almost like watching like a one-man show sometimes just the way he um he not only delivers his lines i mean there's some lines in the film that are uh, immortal to this day um not only in regard in the horror in the context of horror but just in um just in pop culture pop culture in its own um but also how sam raimi and his and his cast and crew again dealing with like a bigger budget than the first movie but still small compared to um the other um horror films of that time just the way that they pull off some of the things that they do and yeah look when you're going to watch the movie if i was going to ask someone who's like 18 years old to watch the film, they might say, well, look, that kind of looks, the the uh, practical effects here look dated, this thing over here doesn't look very realistic, but damn it, the spirit of it and the way that they pull it off in the movie, I love it. And for that, it's going to go up here in the four tier. It's a high four above an American Werewolf in London because, yeah, I think it's just a, it's a fantastic movie. I can't give enough praise to Evil Dead 2, and I think when you talk to most um, horror fans, if they're going to talk about the Evil Dead franchise, especially those original movies, um, they're going to say that the second is the best, and for good reason. If you haven't watched it yet, I really recommend that you do, because it's just a fantastic, fantastic movie. Okay, another Cronenberg film, The Fly. So, again, he's dealing with other material here. This is a remake of a very popular movie. I think it was released in the 40s? So original 1958, all right. Um, so the sequel, uh, sorry, the remake stars Jeff Goldblum as this scientist who has this science experiment where he has these two different pods and it's a, pretty much he's talking about how he can use these pods to transport a, 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 a living tissue, like a living being, organic being, from one pod to another. So it's very much like, you know, teleportation and such. Um, and in his experiments of doing that, he tests on himself. And what happens is that a fly goes into one of the pods when he's in it. And when he transfers over, it's, he becomes a hybrid creature, half man, um, half fly. And as the movie progresses, the fly part starts to take over. And when it comes to David Cronenberg, who I think a lot of people agree is the king of body horror, um, the fly ranks high as one of the, the goriest, most disturbing body horror movies you will ever see. But it's one where, again, its craft is fantastic. The lead performance by Jeff Goblin, I think, like, um, when you look, when you rank his best performances, I think a lot of people um, would look at as his um, performance in this movie as uh, um, Seth Rundle is one of the best. Gina Davis in the movie as well. She gives a fantastic performance as well. Um, much like American Werewolf in London, there's a dream sequence <laughs> in this movie that is incredibly disturbing, um, but very well done. Um, and I think a, a lot of what this film does is really delivers... I hate the term elevated horror um, because 
you know, horror on its own. There's so much different horror. You don't need to have all of it. Horror is horror, right? But I think in regards to this movie, it takes a B-movie concept and just gives it great craft, great filmmaking, great performances. And because of the emotion that these characters bring, um, these actors bring to the characters, and because of David Cronenberg's very serious kind of approach to his um, his filmmaking, it just the film just is lifted. Um, so it's a hybrid in its own. It's like a B movie. It's an A movie picture with a B movie premise. It really is, and it's a cult favorite as well. Like I said, it's a fantastic. I'm going to put it in here. Four behind Dead Zone. I've got a bit of Cronenberg here. I mean, he was just such a prolific uh, presence throughout the 1980s. He really was. Um, I'm going to pop it here. Next up, we're going to delve into the first vampire movie on this list. I believe there's three of them here. Um, in the first one, we're going to do is Fright Night. Again, um, horror comedy. Um, but I think what's really great about Fright Night is that it was one of those. It's one of those vampire movies that is incredibly entertaining, scary. Um, there's a um, there's an element to it. And I think it's really in Chris Sarandon's um, performance as the vampire in the movie, level of a, of danger to it, which I think some movies, um, vampire movies, I think especially lately, um, don't tap into enough. I think the vampire. Um, movie has become really kind of like a really romanticized kind of like almost kind of like a teen movie kind of thing the twilight movies for example really kind of um, um, change things around for that but yeah it's, it's a fantastic movie like i said directed by tom holland um, it's pretty much tells the story of this teenager um, who's convinced that living next door to him is a vampire played by chris sarandon of course no one believes him but his suspicions turn out to be true and he becomes like the next target by the vampire. So him and his friends um, have to try to um, uh, stop this vampire. It, there's some really good twisted turns in the film. There's some places where the film goes where I never thought, didn't think it would go. Um, and there's also um, a really good kind of like a comedic element to it. So, so the character's name is Peter Vincent. So he kind of plays kind of like a Van Helsing kind of character on TV. Um, he's played by Roddy McDowell. Um, does a fantastic job in the movie. And the lead actor... Um, played by uh, who is um just looking here William Ragsdale he plays the role of Charlie, um he convinces um the this this fa fictional vampire slayer that vampires are real and that he has to you know help him uh, destroy this vampire. There's a there's a real um like I said there's a real sinister streak to the movie, um there's a real kind of like um especially in its um, mixture between um the seductive elements of, of vampirism and then also the um, the bloody horror elements to it as well and i think fright night is definitely one of the best uh, vampire movies but i think the, the best vampire movie of the 1980s and for that i'm going to put it in the four column i'm going to put it just i'm going to snuggle it right here in between dead zone and the fly all right next up on the list is now this one's going to be controversial for some there's a reason why i'm wearing this shirt but i'm going to put down ghostbusters in this horror list to me, it's a horror comedy. There are moments in the film that are truly frightening. And I think the whole thing with the supernatural elements and also the, the main, um, the, um, the plot line involving the whole kind of Zool, Goza kind of thing as well is done really well and presented in real kind of um, uh, dark, um, supernatural, um, thrilling fashion. It really is. Like, there's moments in the film that I think are really scary. And for me, it's one of my favourite films of all time, um, you can probably see the, the poster behind me uh, and I'm going to put it up here in the, the five column because I think it's just a fantastic film um, there's a reason why they continue making Ghostbuster films because the premise of the film is just it's just awesome you have a, a essentially a police squad for hunting down ghosts and it's so much um, that um, um, Ivan Reitman the director of the film um, does with the movie with its horror elements, with its um, comedy elements. It's kind of like it's sort, of, sort of an action film as well. Um, I love the gear in the movie, especially I love the, the, the whole <clears throat> world building of it. Um, that is based in like New York City, but they turned New York City into what they call Spook Show, Spook Show Central. It's fantastic. And of course, you've got to talk about the pitch perfect um, casting and performances in this film. Um, Bill Murray delivers one of his best performances in the movie. By all indications, a lot of times he was winging it. Like he was like improvising stuff in the movie as well, but he's such a talented comedian actor. 
Uh, he can get away with that. Dan Aykroyd, the late great Harold Ramis is fantastic. Ernie Hudson, Sigourney Weaver, um, of course, is in a Rick Moranis. I mean, you could go on and on about the um, great cast this movie has. And I think to this day, um, it's one of the best horror comedies, probably up there. Um, it's probably number one on my list as a horror comedy, actually, I'd say. Another horror film um, that spawned a lot of sequels and such, um, but is like the polar opposite of what Ghostbusters is, um, Hellraiser, directed by Clive Barker, um, based on one of Clive Barker's books. And the story of Hellraiser is one that's incredibly disturbing. Um, um, just not only, I'm sure in novel form, I haven't read the story, but just the way um, it's presented in the movie. It's essentially a movie about the, the blending in the, of extremes, of the extremes of violence and sex and how they kind of converge together um, in these people, one character especially, um, who kind of starts the, the film off by trying to find um, pleasures of, a, of the flesh outside of this world. And in doing so, he unleashes, and he actually unleashes, unleashes, you know, hell on earth in bringing forth these demonic creatures known as the Cenobites, led by Pinhead, uh, played by Doug Bradley. A character that has a very um, distinct um, vision, has a very distinct mission statement, and that is that he's going to, if you summon him, he is going to unleash hell upon you that you have, that will be, is leg I think one of the lines he says um, that the suffering you will have will be legendary in the afterlife or something like that. And the depiction of that suffering um, in the violence in the movie, especially in those scenes with the Cenobites. And again, you know, Doug Bradley as Pinhead in the Cenobites and such, they're almost kind of like secondary characters in the movie. I know the the, um, the key art for the, for the movie and the poster and the DVD cover, everything has like, you know, Pinhead there with the box, you know, the little box that, that, they, that summons him. Um, a lot of the movie, though, has uh, delves into these, um, uh, into these characters, um, this married couple. You've got the father and the stepmom, and then you've got the daughter. This kind of like really dysfunctional family, and how um, I don't want to give away too much, but how the father has been taken over by another presence, I, I might say, um, and how. Um, their dysfunction and the the the, the murder the murderous um, activities of the stepmother and this um, other other presence um, bring about the Cenobites. So a lot of them has to do with them doing their thing. So it's almost kind of like a, in a certain way, kind of like a serial killer movie in, in one context, but in the other context you have this very heavy kind of supernatural um, element to the film as well um, in, in the form of the, the Cenobites and, and Pinhead and, and the world that they come from, which... In the second movie, they dive into more. It's not kind of like an afterlife um, in a classic kind of Christian kind of context. Um, where it stands in this list, I think I'm going to place it um, above. It's a high three, so it's going to be above Evil Dead, and, and, and it's going to go right there. It could go in the four here, um, but I'm going to think I'm going to place it here. Um, let's move on to another um, werewolf movie, The Howling, uh, directed by Joe Dante. Now, I'm just going to check what year they came up. I'm just going to check if this came out in 81, the same year as um, it did. So it came out in the same year as uh, American Werewolf in London. The, the transformation scene in the film itself is legendary. I think it was um, Rob Bottoms who, who did that. Because I think, um, yeah, Rob Bottom was kind of like the assistant of, of Rick Baker. And Rick Baker was working on um, American Werewolf. So, um, so... Rob Bottom's like, you know, I'm going to work in this other film, and, and he did so. Both these films came out, and I think it's really great, um, really great work by both men in the one year in these transform transformation scenes. Um, they're both kind of very different in the way that they are, they are presented, but equally um, horrific, equally memorable, um, and I think uh, really does show a um, um, how... Um, makeup effects and, and, and practical effects, and creature effects and creature designs um, really took a leap in the 1980s because of people like your Rick Bakers or your Rob Burton's or your um, uh, Stan Wilson's, um, just the work that they've done is just fantastic. Um, 
Um, but as an overall film, I'm going to give the Howling, I'm going to place it here. So it's going to be a high two because while that transformation scene is great and Dee Wallace's performance, of course, a great Dee Wallace, a great, um, uh, um, you know, one of the best screen queens of, of all time. Um, and, you know, I think this is one of her kind of like um, first big movies. E.T. came after this and so many other films as well, like Cujo and such. Uh, she's still doing great great work now with one of the movies that, she, that I've seen her in. Um, I think the, the film overall just didn't really um, grab me as kind of like um, what the American Werewolf did or other werewolf movies have. Um, I mean, Howling should go down um, as definitely as an influential um, werewolf movie. But as a, as a, but just from, I think I saw it like maybe a couple, rewatched it like a couple of years ago, and just an overall film, and just didn't really grab me like other werewolf movies have. Speaking of films released in the same year, I'm going to look at um, two vampire movies that were released in the same year, 1987. So the first one is The Lost Boy. So this is um, directed by Joel Schumacher. Um, it really is kind of like a, like a teenage uh, vampire movie. It was a teen vampire movie before, you know, you know, Twilight and the like. And it has a great cast. Um, Jason pa Patrick, Kiefer Sutherland. Um, you have Corey Haim and Corey Hart, I think, in their first film together. And they're like, for people who now... No, Corey Haim and Corey Phillip. I know a lot of people kind of look at Corey Phillip and now it's kind of like this kind of like bizarre kind of um, personality, I, I, I guess like you could say. But he was huge in the 1980s. I mean, he appeared in, in so many big films and The Lost Boys is one, was one of them. He's fantastic in the, in the movie as, um, this, as a part of a pair of these vampire slayers. Essentially, it's a movie about this new family that move into a new town called Santa Carla, which I don't think, I think it might be a fictional place in California. I'm not 100%. I don't know. Um, I'm not that big in my um, in my American geography. Um, but um, um, and they come to find out that there's a uh, subculture of vampires led by Kiefer Sutherland's character and his group of like, um, really, you know, really does embrace a 1980s kind of like rock star um, chic look. You know, he's got the leathers and the mullet and everything else and they ride motorcycles and such. It's um, got great performances. Uh, I love the, um, the creature effects in the movie. Um, it's a horror comedy as well, so the, the mix of the two horror co comedy elements are great. Um, and also, um, I, I love um, the soundtrack. When it comes to um, 1980s movies, I think the soundtracks are just fantastic, and this movie has got a fantastic soundtrack um, featuring the likes of um, In Excess and, um, and Jimmy Barnes, especially their song, um, Good Time. And also, it features the... Uh, the whole um, sexy sax uh, <laughs> uh, motif in, in, in one, a memorable um, uh, little performance in that film as well. Um, but as a movie overall, I think, I think I'm going to place it in the high threes here, so above Hellraiser. So just behind the fly. Oh, well, I've got it just behind the fly. Because I love Lost Boys. I mean, Lost Boys was a movie, especially when I was... Um, like a, a younger teen, I used to watch that film all the time. And to this day, um, anything with Jason Patrick in it, I try to watch it because of his performance as Michael. I always found Jason Patrick to be an actor who never... Um, and a lot of it is, is his fault because he, he shunned away from taking big projects. He wanted to do smaller kind of indie art house kind of stuff. But um, he never reached the levels of fame that I believe his talent was deserving of. Um, Having said that, though, he's had a great career and Lost Boys is one of his most memorable performances. Joel Schumacher, who is really hit and miss for me, like some movies are fantastic, some movies aren't. He, he did a really great job here, but I'm going to put him in the high threes. Um, and not far from that, I think I'm going to place it around here. I'm going to have Near Dark. So this was at the other 1987 um, vampire movie, directed by Catherine Bigelow, who... You know, she hasn't made a movie in ages. I think the last movie she did was Detroit. Um, that was released, what, 2012 or something? So Catherine Bigelow, like, where is she? I don't know, but I'd love to see her um, back to doing films because I love her movies, like Point Break, Zero Dark Thirty. I mean, fantastic. And Near Dark is a fantastic movie as well. I'm not sure if it's her first, her first movie, but it's definitely one of her um, better films. And um, stars a uh, great cast. You've got Lance Henriksen. Uh, Bill Paxton, a lot of the cast, a lot of supporting players from Alien, actually, um, Aliens, I should say, are in this movie. Um, Adrian Pastar is the Pastar is the lead in the movie. 
Um, it's kind of like almost like a um, western in a sort of way, like a horror western or a vampire western, some people have called it, in that it's kind of like based in, in rural uh, America. And Adrian Pazdar plays like this cowboy who falls in love with a, a girl. Uh, the girl just has to be a part of a family of vampires, so they kind of um, take him on the road with them and he gives sight to um, their really kind of grisly, uh, murderous ways. There's a scene in the movie... Um, one of the most notorious scenes in the film when they go into a bar, like a honky-tonk, and they just lay waste to the place in a real kind of brutal way as well. Um, so people who uh, can't really stomach, like, bloodletting and violence and such might need to stay away from the dark. But overall, I thought that the, the cinematography in, in the movie is fantastic. Let's do... Okay. So we got here one of the seminal releases of the 1980s, and that's Nightmare on Elm Street. And I'm going to place Nightmare which I think is one of the great kind of like slasher, supernatural slasher films. I'm going to place it around... I think for now I'm going to place it here before Friday Night. The first Nightmare in Elm Street film is fantastic. Wes Craven just reshaped the whole genre. What, um, you know, John Carpenter did with Halloween and um, what the filmmakers did with um, Friday the 13th, I think Wes Craven took those elements and just put this supernatural spin on it and delivered us one of the great um, horror boogeyman slash monsters um, in Freddy Krueger, who Robert Englund, um, I think, delivers one of the best performances in, in horror cinema in the depiction of that character. And the thing about Michael and Freddy is that it's, it's these characters, almost kind of like these lumbering characters where um, whatever, they're not really personable, they don't really, they don't really have a personality to them. Um, their personality is done through their actions, right? Um, the way that they kill, the way their movements and such. Um, Robert England and the, the, the creation of um, um, Freddy Krueger and the way it's presented on screen, of course, there is all that stuff. There's the, the look of the character and the great um, makeup effects of this burned kind of like, you know, um, boogeyman who, from, from the dead who infests the dreams of these teenagers and, and can kill you in, in your dreams, um, or I should say uh, nightmares. Um, but Robert, Un Robert England really brought a personality to the character in the way that he speaks and the way that he kind of um, taunts um, with his victims beforehand and um, almost in a very kind of uh, black comedy kind of way. Um, as, a se as the movies got, went forward, and there was more sequels. Of course, the character developed into almost kind of like a very kind of comedic um, thing, and I, I think it lost kind of a certain amount of um, um, a certain amount of scare factor. There it became almost kind of like the great clown of the horror of horror cinema, um, which of course I don't think is something that Wes Craven, you know, wanted to 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 have in the first place, but. Um, and interesting, interestingly enough, the Freddy Krueger character wouldn't become that really kind of sinister, have, wouldn't have that sinister edge until Wes Craven came back um, to the um, to the um, franchise years years later with um, uh, a new nightmare, which I think was released in nineteen ninety three. It was a very kind of meta um, horror film um, based in the Nightmare Elm Street uh, universe, and I think a lot in a lot of ways kind of set the precedent for what he did with Scream moving on there with the whole kind of meta aspect of, of horror films. Um, but yeah, the first movie, I think to this day, The First Nightmare has such great uh, memorable horror imagery in the film, um, not only in the, the creation of the Freddy Krueger character, but also in a depiction of these of these kills in the movie that were just very um, surreal in a, in a sort, of, sort of way. Um, and uh, in the, the filmmaking in there, the, the, the way that Wes Craven kind of like handled the mythology of the character I thought was just fascinating in itself. Um, we're going to move on now to one of the great haunted house horror movies, and that's Poltergeist, directed by Tobe Hooper. Uh, Tobe Hooper, who of course did the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, um, um, produced and written by Steven Spielberg. There's a, there was a lot of rumours, I think, are still around to today, but I think a lot of people have made it clearer that it's not the case. But... Um, a lot of rumours is that Steven Spielberg was pretty much the ghost director of this movie. Um, and I think you can see it that way in just in the way um, the film is um, shot and the scenes, are, the sequences kind of play out in the film and the way that um, the characters are presented. It does feel very Steven Spielbergian of this middle-class family de de dealing with um, um, 
external elements um, beyond their control. In the case of Poltergeist, it has to do with this family living in a newly um, new developed um, suburb. I think like um, I don't know whereabouts it would it be, like kind of like Arizona or something. I'm not 100 percent sure. I'm pretty sure it might be. Um, and they are haunted. Um, well, not haunted, but as much as they are like hounded by these um, these spirits um, from another world who are not very happy, and they abduct the younger daughter, um, Carol Ann, um, Heather O'Rourke. Yes, she passed away after the third movie. So she appeared in the first three films. Um, and as, you know, another Spielberg think of course, is the use of um, kids in movies, you know, um, even movies he didn't direct, like, you know, Goonies and such. I think uh, kids and teenagers play a vital role as characters in his films. Um, and Heather O'Rourke is a, is a shining example of that. Um, Craig Teague Nelson and Joe Beth Williams play, play the um, the um, the parents in the film. Um, of course, there's a, a great film um, performance by um, Zelda Rubenstein. Plays um, this kind of like um, I don't know if you call her an exorcist, but kind of like a, she comes in and she deals with the supernatural problem. And she, she's just a she's it's just a right. She, she is such a um, uh, authentic kind of presence in the movie to, to this day. A lot of her lines in the movie, especially like This House is Clear, is used um, in a lot of pop culture. Um, it's, a, it's, it's a really great movie, I, I think, Poltergeist. One of my favourite Haunted House movies. I'm going to place it, um, let's see, here, around there, I think, before Angel Heart. Because I think it is, like I said, one of the great Haunted House movies. One of the best movie um, horror movies of that 1980s. A film I think is really kind of great gateway horror. It's rated PG. There's some scenes in it that I don't think are PG, um, but it is rated PG. So if you have like um, 12, 13, 14 year olds, I think they can handle some of the thing, some of the, the the scenes in the movie, and that can really kind of usher them in into other uh, sorts of horror down the line. So it's definitely I, I think a, a gateway horror film. Let's do a few more. Um, one of them I'm going to have to do right now is The Shining, and that goes all the way up here. Speaking about great haunted house horror movies, this is a film I think to me is fascinating. Not only is it a great film, and not only it wasn't made by one of the great filmmakers of all time in Stanley Kubrick, and not only is Jack Dickinson's performance is just so phenomenal and memorable, and the score and the setting. And just so many things in this film is just incredible. I mean, when I, mean, I still watch it today, a lot of it still gives me goosebumps. Um, the whole scene with the little kid riding around with his tricycle around the, the hallways of this um, of this um, uh, empty um, um, hotel in uh, in Colorado. Um, the the scene with the blood coming out of the um, the uh, elevators. Um, Jack Dickerson's gradual kind of descent into madness and psychosis and violence. Um, but what, what really fascinates me about this film too is the almost cultish kind of like conspiracy culture that has developed around it. There's this great documentary called Room 237, which is um, in reference to one of the um, uh, infamous scene in the film um, where they dive into the different conspiracy theories associated with The Shining. Um, and a lot of people believe there are these elements associated to The Shining because Stanley Kubrick was such a perfectionist filmmaker and was just so... Um, every little piece, every little tangent of, of set design, of, of performance, of a lot of things in the movie, um, he took all of that incredibly seriously and did numerous takes um, and would, you know, if something didn't look good, he would have no qualms in just shutting down the day, trashing the whole set and getting everything built again so it comes to his liking. So a lot of people are saying that all these little elements in the film, whether it be a painting in a room or the use of, of, a, of, of a rug in another setting or, or, or you know, the uh, whatever clothes a person's wearing or a certain line of dialogue, it, it has to mean something. Um, and I think I don't buy into a lot of that stuff. Um, just to be very clear, but I just think it's fascinating how this kind of developed around a movie like The Shining, and the movie in its own, it's just absolutely fantastic. It's a, it's one of those films that I think to this day, if you haven't seen it before, 
and you've seen all of these other movies that came afterwards that have clearly been influenced by The Shining, it'll still have an effect on you. Um, and it's not only in the scenes I said before, but it's just about this really dense, thick atmosphere that the film has. It's almost tangible. You can almost feel the crushing weight, especially on the Jack Torres character played by um, Jack Nicholson. Um, it, it has a presence within its own. I think that's the thing about a movie like The Shining or a movie like The Exorcist. They are in themselves as a, as a sort of presence to it. It's almost supernatural in its own. Um, and I think the, the all those elements put together it has just created a, a fantastic movie. Speaking about great films of all time and great horror filmmakers, let's talk about John Carpenter in Thing. One of the great, you know, I don't know if you call it alien invasion, but definitely one of the great sci-fi horror films. Um, again, just like The Fly, um, and just like, you know, movies like Invasion of the Body Snatchers and such, it's, it's, it's a remake of a movie, um, a classic film, which no doubt had a, a great uh, impact on Carpenter himself. I'm just going to look up the, I think the original was called The Thing from Outer Space. Okay, the thing from out of this, the thing from another world, which was released in 1951, much like The Shining, the setting of the film is kind of like this isolated setting where you have just a number of characters kind of stuck in the one location. is done really well. The tension throughout in the film throughout is fantastic. There's a mystery component to it because the whole basis of the film is that there's this alien organism that devours and then takes on. The, the shape, it's kind of like a, almost like a shape-shifting creature of the person that it devours. And throughout the film, you don't know if the person, um, the characters in the film are human or whether they are this monster. Um, and the monster in itself, it doesn't have a, a singular form because whenever it presents itself, it presents itself in kind of like the form, kind of like, I don't know, what, what, what would I call it, the form, kind of like um, transitions of... Of, of you know mutate it's just it's a really kind of a messed up movie and again i think it's rob Bowton who did the special effects on this and as i said again as i said before when it comes to special effects practical effects visual effects creature design um the 1980s are the best and one of the prime examples of this if not the prime example of this is the work that Rob Bowden did in the thing. The way that he goes about creating all these different, I mean, it's really hard to explain. How would I call it? Um, creature effects, but the way they are presented in the film, it's kind of like an amalgamation of all these different organisms and, and, and people that the, thing, that the thing has taken on. They, like It's almost like a, a big kind of like, it's a monster movie, but it's like a monster movie in its own right. It's an alien movie in its own right. It's an alien invasion movie. It's a suspense thriller. It's phenomenal. The thing, it absolutely is. And John Carpenter, you know, his work in the 1980s leading up to the mid-1990s, he hasn't done um, much lately in regards to filmmaking. I know he's more focused on kind of like his composition stuff these days. But... The, the body of work that he put together from Halloween all the way up to, say, um, um, The Mouth of Madness um, is, I think, is untouched in regards of horror filmmaking circles, in regards to directors. Um, and the thing is up there. I think it's his best work. Of course, let's talk about the cast. Kurt Russell, um, long-time collaborator of John Carpenter, stars in the movie. you got got... Um, uh, David Keith as well is fantastic in the film. So many great um, uh, character actors in this movie, and I think that really brought about such a such great um, uh, such a great engrossing, absorbing story. Because the way again, the way the characters are portrayed, it's really straight ahead, great acting by character actors to really great create these engaging characters, and you actually care about what happens to them. We're going to end it there at twenty. So here are twenty. Uh, 1980s horror films. There was other horror films I want to talk about, but we're already at around an hour and a, almost an hour and a half now, so I'm going to leave it there. Um, thank you so much for watching this. Thank you so much for um, for um, you know if you could you know, 
press like if you can subscribe, be fantastic. Check out T Public if you like this shirt, you get T Public. You can also find other great shirts for in all the other links below. And also check out my Patreon. Uh, more tier list there, more reviews, more uh, uh, movie for like movie reactions. Bye. Thank you for watching the Matt's Movie Reviews channel. Please subscribe for more reviews, podcast interviews, and exclusive content.